these types of things, I feel it's important to remember our history as a brewery. You know, we've been around for 31 years, and you go back to the very beginning with Greg and John Hall, they were inspired by English beer and brewing. And I feel it's important to us as brewers with Goose Island these days to continue that thread, that you know, it's in our DNA, that inspiration. And so we wanted to go back into history, back way back into English brewing history. And so we picked a recipe from 1840, a London porter that we're calling Obadiah Poundage. In order to make this beer, we collaborated with beer historian Ron Pattinson who writes a blog called Shut Up About Barclay Perkins. And we, we caught up with Ron in London recently to get his thoughts on that brewery and some of the history of Porter. Well, we're here at the Anchor Tavern on the south bank of the River Thames, which used to be the brewery tap of the largest brewery in the world for a long time, Barclay Perkins, which was really important in the history of Porter brewing and in the history of brewing in general. And for a period of about 100 years, it was always either the largest or the second or third largest brewery in Britain. And that meant necessarily the whole world at the time. So it was a really important brewery in its day. It's one of the breweries where the original Porter was developed. It made its fortune on Porter. And it was hugely influential in the industrialization of the whole brewing process. Obadiah Pound had started out with Ron and I wanting to do a beer together. Ron said, let's do a keeping Porter after seeing these vats. And then, in my mind, I felt like we needed a London brewer, like a modern day London brewer involved in this project because London is such at the heart of this beer. And immediately we knew there was no better person than Derek Prentice, who's been brewing in London for 50 years, started at Truman's, brewed at Young's, brewed at Fuller's, and now is at Wimbledon Brewery in London. Well, we're very close to where it started, uh, right on the corner, in fact. Uh, we're in the Golden Heart pub here in, in Shoreditch, and uh, the Truman Brewery literally is no more than 50 metres, uh, 50 yards in the old days, uh, behind us over there. Um, and this certainly was one of our locals, and we would come in here quite a bit. My first week of Brewing and working in the laboratory of a brewery convinced me that brewing was a fantastic career and I wanted to stay in it. So, so I started here in, in the summer of 1968. Brewing at uh, the, the site as it was then, it was still a very old, uh, huge rambling site and it was uh, almost an in, a, a sort of industrial giant in the middle of the city. Uh, and some of the breweries still were, there were there was still a lot of brewing going on in London in, in, in that period, probably close to 7 million barrels being brewed. When I joined the company, there was this strong history of it associated with Truman's. Truman's were one of the biggest porter brewers. At one time in their history, they were the largest porter brewery, they were the largest brewery in the world. Britain at the time had a lot of armies and, and, and elements in the empires. And, and porter was exported throughout the world. We looked, at a, we looked at various recipes from that period. They were all around the same period, that kind of 1840, 1850 period. All London breweries, of course, making porter. Uh, and we decided on a Truman's recipe because it looked like, it just looked the best recipe. So once we picked the recipe, we started to go through process and ingredients. So, and I learned a lot from Derek and Ron. We, I really got an understanding of how different a beer porter was 180 years ago than it is now. And I identified really three critical pillars to the success of it. The malt, the aging, and the blending. Uh, London really was a center for darker beers, largely governed by the water. So this process happened with pale and darker beers, but because London was a centre for darker beers, for two reasons. One is the water is better and suits uh, <coughs> brewing darker beers. They have a higher level of natural acidity, uh, but also brown malt was cheaper than the pale ale malts that were being produced. And the London brewers were always looking to, to make economies where possible. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we're a small malt house in the middle of Massachusetts and we started in 2009 with the idea that we wanted to connect local farms, local grains with local craft breweries. Well, I think a lot of times when you're looking at historic styles of beer, it's one thing to be able to recreate that beer with modern ingredients. It's another thing to sort of look at the raw materials that made up that beer and try to understand them. Um, you know, certainly the brown malt that you're gonna get today is not the brown malt of the mid 18th century. So um, trying to recreate a brown malt that's more authentic to that time period um, really hopefully will make a beer that's more authentic to that time period. Well, mid 19th century porter, London porter, they always have pretty much the same grist. It's almost always a combination of pale brown and black sometimes amber in some of the more expensive beers, but they always have pale brown and black, always those three. And by that time, you've got a different sort of brown malt to the one they had in the 18th century. So they'd gone away from having a diastatic brown malt, which is what they had in the original porter when it was 100% brown malt beer. And they'd gone over to using this highly flavored brown malt, which was made a very specific way with the horn beam, very high temperature, basically turning it into a popcorn at the end of the process. And that was the, the type of brown malt they were using at this period. It's called snapped malt, it's called brown malt. But essentially it's a type of malt that was made specifically for London Porter beers. They have a smoky character to them from the fuel that we're using to kiln the, the, the malt. Um, and really the process is the same as making a pale malt except for that final Probably curing yet. stage or that final kilning stage. Um, rather than having a uh, low temperature, high airflow to take off moisture, you have low airflow and high temperature. Um, and that high temperature that we're doing is coming from um, a specific type of wood that was uh, documented being used. It was a hardwood called ironwood or hornbeam which would have been available in the UK and also happens to be available in this area. So we were able to harvest this ironwood last year, let it cure, and now we're using that as a fuel source to be able to dry down this barley um, and basically subject it to pretty high heat that as it's wet allows it to do a little bit of stewing to create some sugars and then toward the end we're just using temperature to really take the rest of the moisture off and create some and develop some color. So the brown malt is critical to making a London Porter. We, we could not recreate London Porter without brown malt made this way. And it provides a lot of flavor and character to this beer. But we needed a pale malt to really make up the majority of the grain bill. And we wanted a malt that would be as authentic to period as possible. And thankfully, we were able to find this through Crisp Malting Group. They are floor malting a heritage variety of barley called Chevalier. The only reason this barley variety exists is through the work of Dr. Christopher Riddow, who revived Chevalier from seed. Chevalier uh, was pretty much the only malt available from about uh, mid-1820s up until the 1920s, that's nearly a hundred years, a single variety of barley, and it is throughout the world. And even when, with modern plant breeding techniques, um, uh, Chevalier had declined, it was still winning those beer competitions held here in London. Um, so it must have had something special about it. Um, and so we were intrigued by that, and we thought it would be a great idea just to bring it back to life so we went to our seed collection with just literally with a handful of seeds. Uh, we brought it back into uh, commercial production. And so we're able to now recreate beers from that period with authentic Chevalier malt barley. The big innovation of Porter, and that Obadiah Poundage makes that very clear in his letter, wasn't necessarily the type of beer that was being brewed, but it was the way it was handled. And so until Porter, brown beer, which was what it was. Sometimes it had been aged, but it hadn't ever been aged by the brewery. The brewery had always sent it out st straight after primary fermentation. And any aging that was done was either done in a pub cellar or even done by third parties who'd age beer and then sell it on. 
Well, um, I mean, if you go back 300 years or so, um, brewing really only took place during the winter months because of the problems with infection. But brewing beer was very much the staple drink of the population. Uh, and, and the weaker beers. But to get the weaker beers, normally the brewing was uh, done so that you produce a strong beer and then a beer that, from the second runnings, uh, in the same way that you might make a pot of tea, you pour out the first one, it's quite strong, you add some water and you get a second one. But the stronger beers would be laid down. Some of the brewers realised there was money to be made in this and they started ageing the beer themselves. And they found out that if they just aged the beer for about six months, then they could get quite a good effect, some of the aged character without having to keep it stored away for too long. And that's what the original porter was. Originally it was all uh, beer that had been aged a little bit, not too long. Then you see gradually they get the idea that it's easier if instead of aging all of it, you just age some for quite a long while and then blend it in with the young porter and then you get a similar effect but it's cheaper to do. And so then they start brewing the two types of porter. You have the running porter which is the one that's going to be sold young and you've got the keeping porter which is the one that's going to be aged. Aging porter isn't something we really consider today but that's how it was made for a very long time. I think what's so interesting about the history of porter is how contemporary it really is. Aging beer in large oak vessels. This is something we do here in Chicago, but generally with paler beers with lower hop rates, trying to achieve a degree of acidity. This is what was called a keeping porter. It's a highly hop beer aged six to 12 months in large wood vats, though the great London breweries had vats much larger than these. Uh, this beer contains Britannomyces, which means British fungus. It was isolated from English beer in the early 20th century, known to be present in beers of that time. So our beer is aging with Britannomyces clausinii. Uh, this beer is 12 months old. It's um, leathery, got a lot of overripe fruit character to it. Um, it's got a degree of acidity, but the, the hopping really prevents it from being a sour beer. And that's intentional. That's how these beers were made. Blending is for this, it was actually quite simple. It was spelled out in the book that Derek showed us that in 1840, it was one third keeping porter to two thirds running porter. So we, and we wanted to be true to that period, that specific year. And so we knew out of the gate that it was gonna be one third aged beer and two thirds fresh beer. This method of blending uh, an aged beer with a fresh running beer did a number of things. One, it introduced strong beer flavour, but more importantly, it introduced fresh beer that would sparkle it up, that would give it that extra fizz, make it more presentable, because obviously a, a beer which had been stored and quite strong and possibly soured would be quite flat and not, you know, on its own, perhaps quite so appreciated by the porters, and the porters weren't just in the market, and we're very close to the market here. Porters were a bit a bit like we now use couriers, you know, you call up uh, a courier and they come and they collect, they take a letter, they take a parcel, they carry, par uh, you know, sacks, they'll deliver stuff, you know, so the porters were all around, not just associated with the markets. Now to store in small containers is quite, A, it's expensive for small containers and B, uh, they take up a lot of space. And so they built bigger and bigger and bigger of that, I mean, vats that held tens of thousands of barrels, I mean just ridiculously large vats and they'd have row upon row of these and the, the brewers were very proud of this, it was like a sort of uh, who's got the biggest type of game that they had, so uh, every, everyone wanted to have the largest porter vat and you see all these stories about you know a party of 20 dining inside a vat that was so big that you could get dozens of people into them, They're, I mean if you see the, the drawings in uh, Bernard of, uh, of the porter vat, sometimes they put a character figure in so you can see the scale. You have a vat that's like that big and there's someone that big at the bottom of it. So it's like this sort of five storey building worth of uh, wood. Uh, and these were the porter tons and they lived in a porter ton room. And this thing stretched from the ground probably to more than 60 foot high with a single span wooden beam building. And these vessels went from floor to top. They were massive. They were huge. For some reason in the 1860s, the age flavour seems to start going out of fashion. And what happens is you see that the production of keeping porter 
keeps dropping off year after year and eventually they just stop with it. So about 1870 it finished. The idea for this beer originally came up when I was in Chicago going around the barrel room and noticed there were some nice big vats and thought, hmm, wouldn't it be nice to put some porter in one of those? So the name Obadiah Poundage. Uh, he was a brewery employee. He wrote a letter to a London newspaper describing how porter was made in the 18th century. Beer historians like Ron use this letter to reference uh, the process of how porter was made. So it's, a, it's a kind of a critical document. So it's not just a funny name. It actually has a lot of importance to the history of porter brewing. Well, I think Obadiah Poundage is a good name. Yeah. Well, just because Obadiah Poundage is a good name, full stop. I, I don't know where he came up with that. It's, it's not the guy's real name. No one knows who he was, which is slightly frustrating. What, what is known about Ob Obadiah Poundage? Um, what they reckon was that he was an uh, outdoor cooper. So an outdoor cooper being the guy who went round and checked on the pub cellars to make sure they were looking after the beer right. And so these were people who knew a lot about the industry from both sides, so from the brewery side and from the pub side. And he seems to have quite a lot of knowledge of all of it because he, he goes into it in great detail. And some of the terminology he uses is obviously an insider. So the whole thing about the, mis mis the misunderstanding about three threads, which comes from people not understanding one of the brewery terms he used, which is starve, which means laying down to uh, mature not tapping, which is what people assumed in the 19th century. And that's why you come up with that whole myth about three threads being the origins of porter. Sure. Whereas Obadiah Poundage actually explains perfectly clearly what the origins of porter are. It's just that people didn't read it properly. I mean, I can understand it, but then again, I, stick, I have my head stuck in brewing records most yeah. of the time. You're the living Rosetta Stone <laughs> of brewing records. <laughs> wow, don't know about that. Well, uh, uh, Derek's pretty good as well. He knows some weird stuff about brewing. Oh, it's, I mean, for me, it stems back to those early days when they joined the, joined the brewery here. Uh, I mean, I just found the whole place, the whole brewery, and, and it was old. Uh, it was, you know, higgledy-piggledy, as a lot of breweries, it had been built and added on over the years, but it, there was so much history, there was so much romance. I mean, I would sit, because we'd be on shift and I'd be, we used to move in for the weekend, we had our little flat, and I would just sit up in the flat or go out into the brewery and you could just sit and look at the roofs. And it was just magical. You know, these old buildings, there were rooms that people hadn't been in for years with old copper vessels in, uh, full of cobwebs and, you know, forgotten corners. There were, there were, the rooms were all named after famous events, you know, one was called Mafeking, another was called Old House and had old slate vessels. Uh. But don't go too mad because they will go, yeah. now just be careful, this is quite likely to be lively. Okay. And it's it was just full of both wonderful historic buildings full of romance and characters the people that you work with all breweries seem to attract characters It's really, I think it's quite pleasant. It's got notes of the aged beer, the Britannomyces, the kind of leather, tobacco, uh, light acidity, but the fresh beer brings some, uh, some roundness, some malt character to it, a little bit of sweetness. Uh, it's quite nice. And it keeps you coming back for more, which is important. So for me, the best part of this project, of this two and a half years, uh, in the making to get this beer to the bottle is really the people we worked with. Uh, Ron, Derek, Andrea, and Chris it was a, just an awesome team of individuals that contributed uh, their expertise in their given areas. The other great part about this brewing project, about making Obadiah Poundage, was the obvious, right? The beer in the glass. We get to actually taste history. You know, we can look at records we can look at archives and how beers were made 200 years ago, but um, we, until we brew them, we don't know how they taste. And so our goal is to, uh, is to tell this really 
interesting story about the history of, of Porter and how important it was to brewing history. But at the end of the day, we want people to come and taste the beer and enjoy it. Because um, I really think it's, it, it's an amazing beer. Cheers. <laughs>